You know, I want to start this out by saying something that I always start out saying in these webinars. There is no dress rehearsals when it comes to trading. You're putting your own money on the line. And what I've learned from the pit bull is that his best trades were not necessarily winning trades, but he'll get into that on his own. Um, a couple quick slides here. This, this webinar has been dedicated to Charlie D. Francisca. And Charlie D. was a really well-known bond trader on the board of trade floor that believed in sharing his knowledge was was his obligation or his duty to the markets or into the into the other locals around him and as the pitbull is going to be doing today he's going to be sharing some of his ideas and thoughts and and to me that's at the center of trading if you if you want to be selfish if you want to sit around you don't want to you don't want to um share your thoughts those thoughts will disappear it's eventually and what we're here to do today is talk about some of the things that we think work and really like i said the Pitbull is going to be unplugged. And if you read this, this is an, ep this is an excerpt from the Market Wizards book that talks about Marty's um, entering into these different um, Norm Zeta trading contests. And it's an amazing, it's, a, it's just an amazing thing what he's done um, as an individual trader. And to tell you the truth, as I've said many times, I've worked with some of the largest traders in the world, and Marty's one of them. Marty is one of them. He is it. I'm, anyways, I'm going to turn it over to Marty. Well, I had thought that we would do uh, Q and A at some point, but uh, uh, I'd rather we just banter back and forth, Danny. Uh, I met Danny in the late '80s, and um, we started out. I was trading S and P's uh, on the telephone, and he was in Chicago, and he asked me, "Well, what do I want him to do for me?" And I said, "Well, just follow those." Who win and let me know what they're doing you know just watch what they're doing and uh, he utilized his street smarts to uh, kind of give me info from the pit uh, that was very helpful to me uh, but as things have evolved through a long period of time uh, things have changed as electronic uh, trading came to bear and the computerization of the markets uh, uh, transpired. Um, I have had an evolution in my career. I started trading the S&P futures in 82 when they first came into being, 1982 that is, and um, I then uh, uh, progressed through a period of time and I've had my ups and downs doing it uh, and I've evolved using a lot of options and stocks as well as using S&P futures. Uh, in the early 2000s, I went and traded the oil market for nine years, traded an awful lot of options. And um, at the end of uh, 2013, I decided it was time to return to the S&Ps. And since then, I've been trading a great deal of S&P options. In that sense, I like to be the bookmaker. I sell a lot of option premium as I've built my capital up and that's allowed me to uh, have a great opportunity in doing that. There have been statistics through the years that 90, 90 to 95 percent of the options expire worthless so uh, I root very hard for them to go to zero. <laughs> um, I don't know what you, whether you, what you want to do Danny, you want to throw me Well some here, questions? you know what, I'll jump in. Um, I kind of want to go back to what Marty was talking about back in the beginning. When I first met Marty on the floor, he had a, he had a, he had a girl, by, girl working for him that sat next, right, to the, right next to the Salomon Brothers desk. If anybody remembers who Salomon was, um, they were plaza on the trading floor, and they, they always seemed to have the news before anybody else had it. And I had this big desk, and Marty was trading away with the girl that worked for him, Debbie, and one day, Debbie came up to the floor. We were doing the business. Um, I think we were doing Sheikh Mohammed's business one. Or, um, yeah, we were, no, we were doing King Fod's business. And King Fod was kept buying and selling these 3,000 lot orders in the S&P. And they were so noticeable. And one day, Debbie came over to my desk and said she'd like me to call this guy Marty. And well, I, 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 no swipe at Marty. I had never met him before. So I didn't call him right away. And then a couple days later, she came back to the desk and she said, listen, will you please call him? He wants, he wants to talk to you. So I, I, I finally got around to the call 
and Marty said something to me like, and we had just met. I thought it was it was one of the you know it was it was very straightforward. And he was very honest about what he wanted, but he said, "Look, if you don't if you're not going to pick up the phone and return my calls, you can't do my business." And from that day on, I knew exactly what he was talking about. You know, listen, if you want to communicate with me, you get online and you start talking. So I started doing the business and. Marty had an amazing, he just was an amazing at picking levels. And every day, Marty would call me with what he would call his channel lines. And we would trade off these channel lines. But back then, you were only trying to make what? How much a day, Marty? 10,000. He was trying to make 10 grand a day. And after the S&P, back around that time, I think he even talked about taking out an ad in the Wall Street Journal about condemning program trading back then. So he was way, way ahead of the curve on this stuff. And again, I'm going to let him talk because I don't want to be doing all this. But um, at one point, program trading continued to take up more volume of the S&P, and it just became harder to trade. And what trades he would be looking at, he'd call me up and say, listen, if the S&P gets down to 645 even. Well, let me interrupt you. There were, um, in those days, they did, uh, the program trades were sent by paper orders. And I noticed a pattern where they would uh, get everything done by the half hour. They would, uh, um, 1027, they would start and they'd say, be done by 1030. Um, and it was very interesting because Danny eventually was able to detect uh, there, there'd be about three waves of sells or buys. And once they um, uh, finished, the market would fall in the other direction. So that was a good clue. Uh, I was always looking for changes in direction in trading the market. But one of the things um, we tried to instill in Danny was that uh, nobody we didn't want anybody to outwork us ever. And that's sort of what I would preach to you today. I still, to this day, I'm going to be 70 next month. and. Um, I still do my work every single night and love uh, doing it because um, the charts kind of speak to me. I was at a dinner party last night and some guy who trades asked me, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I, you know, half uh, uh, comically said, I draw a lot of lines. And, you know, I've, I've, I've got Edwards and McGee, the chart book in my uh, bookcase, but I've never read it. I just started getting <laughs> charts and drawing lines. And then they sort of talk to you. Um, and you notice levels where when the stock or futures chart comes down to the level. For instance, the last uh, month we came down to about nine, low 1970s in the S&P futures. And it looked like death warmed over at that point. And that's where you get your maximum reward and what you think is your maximum risk. But it's really not your maximum risk because it's a trade you can put on with a limited amount of risk by um, um, knowing that you can uh, risk a smaller amount because you've already declined into that level. To the same extent, uh, the market has a way of, of tricking you when everything looks so fantastic. You want to um, uh, grab a hold of... Uh, um, a large number of contracts, and it's usually a, a sucker play. So um, it's very, it's, I found that by preparing the night before and putting levels in on my sheet that I keep prior to the opening, uh, that acts as, serves as a reminder for me to um, uh, be particularly aware that that's an area where I want to go the opposite, even though my emotions are suggesting uh, that I want to uh, go with the flow, the exact best trade is to do the opposite thing. Um, Danny, I don't want to rattle on. I really wanted, no, to, no. I well, really wanted to entertain Jeff, questions from, from people right. uh, in the universe there. Okay. R.S., question. How do you know it is a change of direction rather than a pullback in trend? Well, I use the charts, and um, I draw a lot of lines, and um, it, what you're really always looking for is a high risk-reward point. So when something pulls back, you don't know. You're never going to know until uh, 
the uh, trade plays out. But what you're looking for are lower risk entries. And uh, the problem is, is that when the opportunity presents itself, you're usually carrying some bad inventory or you're pissing in your pants. So uh, um, that's why I suggest that you have uh, scenarios set up from the night before. Um, the biggest thing is you're carrying bad inventory, and that's what makes the trade so difficult. Okay. Um, Elliot D., what strategies do you use to trade the T-theory looking at credit derivatives indicators like you like to watch? I think I've got to go back to college for that one. <laughs> um, the Terry Laundry uh, developed a T-theory where he said that uh, uh, markets spend the same amount of time going up and down, not necessary amplitude, but he would then have a cash buildup phase while the market was declining, and he tried to do a match time sequence. Um, that's just another tool I use. I, I still, to this day, have about a 20-foot chart on my desk that uh, I keep pasting together where I calculate the and post the 18-day oscillator and the MTO. And when it comes down to certain levels, you always think it's going to be uh, much worse. It's much better at bottoms than it is at tops. but. Um, uh, with the advent of the program training and the bull market we've been in, um, it hasn't had quite the amplitude um, that it had in more difficult market declines. So it makes it tricky. The thing that I look for in that, in the oscillator, is a rising bottoms pattern. When it would come down to a very severe level, um, invariably, it would produce a price retest or new low within one to three weeks. So what I would look for is a higher oscillator turn, uh, but a lower price than the uh, level when the oscillator made its largest descent. So when I would get a, a non-confirmation in the oscillator with a lower price, uh, then I would look for a turn, and once I got the turn, I would send it in. That is to the bookie. Okay, good. Um, YUWA said, how do you use late Terry Laundry short-term oscillator to come with a daily basis? I just look for patterns. I mean, there's no um, uh, foolproof thing. There are a lot of other tools I use. For instance, I use a weighted trend in addition to his oscillators. Ten, um, once again, a high trend trading index, the arms index, uh, above 130 to 160 gives you an idea that you're looking for a counter trend move to the upside. It's much better at, bo at uh, bottoms to suggest a turn to the upside than it is at tops. For instance, when it gets below 80, and by weighted average I'm talking about an 18 and ex an exponential weighted average of 18 and 82, um, 82 being times the average in 18, the most recent event, so that it, it's front end loaded on the trend. Um, when it gets below 80, it doesn't necessarily predict the top uh, because things can stay overbought much longer than your wallet can hold out. So it's, it's much better at bottoms than it is at tops. One other little trick I found is that when you get a trend above 300, it would generally occur when Lowry's would have a 9 to 1 down day. And occasionally in bad bear markets, you'd get a second day. And if you got a second trend intraday at 300, unless it was 1987, you would have a very strong bounce out of there. So what I do is I utilize a lot of different tricks that I've accumulated over the years, and there's no lead pipe cinch. Everything you're trying to do uh, is improve your probabilities of success. Okay. Um, 
I got a couple of questions here, Marty. Um, well, Den Dennis S. is asking, oscillator bars or candlesticks? Um, I use uh, oscillators in uh, channels. I look at candlesticks, but I, I'm, uh, I don't study the different methodologies. What I try to do is, is look at it viscerally and, uh, and visually as opposed to any rule book. I just look at all different things and try to put it into the mosaic. Uh, uh, and a lot of um, things are sixth sense because I've done it for a long time. And um, one of the things I've lectured about, a couple of things I've lectured about, is you should only choose a methodology that fits who you are as a person. Um, I've said uh, many times I could take a hundred people, hundred of the best educated people, and maybe one or two would walk out successfully uh, and become a good trader because really what would uh, happen is your life's history up till then might sabotage your potential success. So you have to choose a methodology and risk parameters that you're comfortable with. and. Um, that's for you to determine uh, uh, what you can handle risk-wise. Okay, here's that question I thought was interesting. From Greg M. Marty, you started this endeavor, endeavor as a young man. Do you think it's likely that a 55-year-old can learn to day trade index futures with the advent of algos and HFT? Great question. Do I think it's possible? Uh, I was raised you can accomplish anything. When I turned 60 I, and the kids were pretty much through with school, uh, I said, this is my Ray Kroc decade. And um, yeah. I, um, the last three years, I've had my biggest earnings ever. This uh, yesterday completed the month of February 2015. I had by far my biggest month ever uh, and uh, scared the daylights out of me because it was so good. Um, the, so I would say that uh, it's never too late. I do think that trading the index futures are extraordinarily difficult. I use them only to hedge now and they're normally uh, a contra position to what my major option position is and the reason I'm able to do options and I sell premium, I rarely ever buy it, um, is because I have such a large capital base. It's much more difficult but you can, you can sell a small amount, you know, a few options. Um, there's nothing like the excitement of winning trading the futures but with the algos, um, when I referred to that level, uh, we made a low uh, early February or late January. I can't remember. I need a chart, but uh, be that as it may, we bought we bottomed in the, at February third, two thousand fourteen. I was getting smoked um, when the market came down, and in the back of my mind, January was bad, and I said, "Well, maybe we're going to bottom just like we did last year." And so I'd set that scenario up in my mind. But um, you have to pick levels and be extraordinarily disciplined. It's not as quite as exciting, but I think day trading the futures is just extraordinarily difficult. Danny, with me, with 27 years of experience, is scratching them out. But uh, it's very, very hard. And uh, I think what I wanted to point out was when we went down to the um, if you refer to earlier in the month when we went down, I had drawn a line across 1971 on my charts, and I think we went to 1973. So I was, didn't know whether we were going to break 1971 or, we were, they, or whether they were going to fish for the last stops. What I've noticed with the algos, in the old days, before the computerized trading existed, when Danny was on the floor, they would have a deck of cards. Uh, not playing cards, but um, they and they would have stops in their decks, so they would know where um, the locals would try to aim to to um, knock out the stops. Because what that would do was create a fresh supply of red meat for them, and um, when they got those, 
That's what, they, that's what I've been talking about. They were getting low risk entry points. It was very similar to the thing that we talked about in program trading in the old days when uh, we would get three waves. And once the third wave would um, um, occur, the selling or buying pressure, whichever direction they were doing the program, would diminish. And I always talk <clears throat> about first and second derivatives and calculus. It's like you're driving your car and you're going 70 miles an hour, but you're coming up to a stop sign. You're going from fourth if you're driving a stick shift. And I assume all you wealthy traders out there are driving a very fancy car. Um, <laughs> Uh, you're downshifting from fourth to third to second to first, and then when you come to the stop, you're in neutral. And then you're going to accelerate after you've looked both ways and made sure the crossing guard is out of your way. And um, you're going first, second, third, and, and reaccelerating the car. The same thing's true in trading, where you're, you're looking for changes of direction. And um, that's what I recommend, but the discipline that's required uh, is enormous. Now, getting back to a point I made earlier, it's a function of um, what your life's experiences have been. And now, see, I'm an inveterate gambler. Uh, you know, I was pitching nickels at the corner grocery stores, flipping baseball cards, <laughs> and all those things, which I'm sure at least half of you have done in your previous lifetime prior to taking on trading. Um, so you have to get that under control. Another psychological thing I talk about is are you more interested in the action or are you more interested in winning? I, I wrote in my book and uh, I didn't become a success till I start becoming a success till I got married and I always said that life's not a dress rehearsal. This was time to stop screwing around and become successful. So I buckled down and developed a methodology, and um, uh, I was able to uh, read a lot of different approaches and incorporate it into my own. I, I call myself a synthesizer, not a guitar, but a, a synthesizer whereby uh, I take different approaches and just sort of see what works for me in my own mindset. Um, if you're going to try to day trade, realize that you're in, in, uh, invoking on one of the uh, toughest tasks against some of the smartest people in the world. It's kind of like uh, IBM's computer Watson when they were playing uh, chess against the uh, world chess champion. Uh, You've got to really be super disciplined. And you have to ask yourself, am I craving the action or do I really want to win and be successful? And until you can answer that, you should save your money. Charlie R. says, does Marty see the VIX as a leading indicator? Any observations on his professional use of the VIX? You know, well, the VIX is um, an interesting tool. I'm not sh quite sure how it's calculated. Um, where I made a lot of money in my oil options was when the VIX was high. In December of uh, 2013, after nine years of trading a lot of oil options and making quite a bit of money, um, the VIX had gone into the high teens where it had in the previous years been above 100 and on its way through 50 and then into the mid 20s. And when it um, declined into the teens, I just felt the risk reward uh, that was left for me was extremely dangerous selling premium. In the S&P, the reason why I like going back to the S&P options is that uh, oil is more of a homogeneous entity and the VIX in the stock market is, you have so many other indicators to look at. So the likelihood of it having a dramatic move, lately it's been um, going between 12 and 24. So last summer when it got down 12, 13, it's 13 now, um, is when my risk increases dramatically. It can stay 
at the bottom and bottom feed for six months or can stay there for six days. Um, you have to start to think about going the opposite direction. So for me, I have an enormous amount of short puts on in the S&P that expire in three weeks. And I'm hoping the VIX stays tame for a little while longer. Uh, <laughs> but um, when I start to put on short option positions at this low level, my risk increases dramatically. So the corollary to that is my size has to diminish. But that gets back to my gambling issue. Uh, <laughs> I like to, the thrill of having a, a large uh, P&L. So I have to um, pull back on my uh, desire to have the excitement and be much more prudent. So I use the VIX as a contrary indicator or a warning sign that, uh, for instance, um, um, if we were to have a, my, uh, were successfully to exit my option positions, which in my case has have them go to zero and I get all the premium. Um, the best thing that I talk about theoretically is letting the VIX spike up and then come in and hit them with a lot of premium sales. Uh, but I get bored, so uh, I get involved. <laughs> but it's, a, it's useful in that regard. I traded the VIX options one time and it was a disaster. I put them on when the VIX was 12. This was a number of years ago when they first came out. And the VIX spiked, but I couldn't get out of the options because they didn't go anywhere because they were a European expiration, I guess. I'm not quite sure whether I'm phrasing it right. Oh, that's uh, right. But um, uh, the VIX index went way up, but my options did nothing. So. <laughs> um, I, that experience left me, it was like kind of a very bad date. I didn't want to go back again. Uh, one of the things that Danny's found with the market delta, this is a 30 second commercial. No, uh, no, 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 I'm joking. Um, is that uh, he seems to have uh, uh, different indicators that help you identify turning points that Danny puts out on his uh, uh, IM during the day. Uh, and when he gets a series of sequences of buys or sells, sometimes that's useful. Yeah. Well, Marty, one, one, I can't see the question right now, but somebody asked, what did you learn from your biggest losing trade? Um, that capital preservation is the most important thing you can have other than um, uh, making a lot of money. That's the old story. I love numbers. So if you lose a third, I think it takes, you have to make 50% return to get back to even. So somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's very important to uh, not let your losses get out of control. I mean, one of the things you should think about prior to entering a trade is considering how much you're willing to lose uh, in that trade. Now, one of the best trades I ever made was a huge loser. In, uh, eight, on uh, October 16th of uh, 1987, I went home very long because it was option expiration day. I think the market was down 108 points that day, somewhere in that range. And uh, I thought it was being pushed down by the option expiration. And... Um, uh, so I went home long, and we cracked the next um, Monday. We're, we ended up being down 500 and something points, 16%. Um, but um, what occurred, I'm going to get some water, Danny, yeah, at I'll some point. Right but uh, um, I, the market opened down 200 points and rallied it down 100, at which point I hit the, hit the exit, and I lost many hundreds of thousands of dollars, but was very happy to have done it because had I stayed in, I would have really been hurt with a much greater loss. So that was a, a very good decision. The interesting thing was I also, thank you, I also bought um, options on Friday and um, um, the um, 
uh, VIX, the volatility index, increased so much, they actually suspended trading options for a while. But the volatility increased so much that um, I was able to get out of the options. That's not the problem. It's the ice in there, Danny. Yeah. <laughs> That's the problem. Uh, Take the glass back. The options uh, uh, had increased so much uh, in volatility that I didn't lose that much money. I was shocked, but uh, that was an interesting lesson as well. I, th I think, we, I think I, we all will agree that based on the volumes, we all know that there's less trading going on in the futures right now. And Marty's moved as one of the premier futures traders in the whole world with two options. So let's get a couple of option questions in here. Mark L says, how far out of the money do you sell premium? Well, uh, what I found, Mark, is that um, um, the premium in the puts, because they're so bought by institutions as life insurance, you know, um, or portfolio insurance, have premiums that are two to three times as large as the um, calls, because the market seems to go up more slowly uh, and methodically uh, than it goes down. With there's some sort of exogenous event so that uh, I've been selling puts that are 300 plus points out of the money okay. uh, and calls um, they can be uh, 80 to 100 points out of the money because the markets if the market had a big rally go up 20 30 handles I can adjust my position the other thing I utilize are firewalls uh, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but what I'll do is, for instance, I'm short a lot of 2180 calls, but I'm long the 2200 calls uh, on a, uh, a back spread. That way, uh, if I have to adjust, but it also um, diminishes my margin requirement. Um, but on puts, uh, I'll be at least two to 300 S&P points away which are 1,600 to 2,500 Dow points. So you would have to have a, a cataclysmic decline. The problem I would encounter if it were to occur would be the VIX exploding from a low level and requiring me to put up a great deal more margin, at which point I would then put on firewall put spreads, which I do all the time, where I'd buy the 1850s, and sell the 1750s. And then as a, after the market stabilizes, I would um, uh, sell out the 1850s once I, I feel comfortable that the, the uh, tornado or thunderstorm is over with and I can go to get out of the storm cellar. Marty, this is from Greg M. Marty, it's very difficult for a small trader to sell premium. What would you trade if you were starting to trade with a $25,000 account? Sell one lot. Sell one lot. Yeah. Sell two lots. I think he's right there. Um, I know I'm right. Yeah. Right. Start small and work your way up. Um, I had a motto when I first started out, which was 1979, and I had uh, nothing. I, had a, I bought a seat on the Amex. It's all documented in various publications, but... And I borrowed money from my in-laws. I borrowed fifty thousand dollars because I for working capital, and I think my mother-in-law was very upset when I paid it back in six months because she didn't have control <laughs> any longer. But the first year I did it, uh, I made six hundred thousand dollars, so I was uh, on my way to financial freedom. Um, I had a I had a uh, a saying that if I made money every day. Every week, every month, and every year, nothing bad could happen to me. So with the $25,000, I think you're sitting pretty. I don't know whether you'll make a living doing that, but you can make a return. You have to have a realistic objective. Um, you know, would you be happy with a 35% a 30 annualized rate of return, which would make you uh, better than Warren Buffett if you could do it for 40 or 50 years? Well, you're only going to make $7,500 in the year. So you have to have realistic expectations. Um, if you're going to uh, try to make uh, 
a quarter of a million on your 25,000, I got some money in my wallet that says you're going broke. So <laughs> you have to have realistic expectations and uh, be very, very patient. But if you uh, can make be profitable most months and be profitable for several years, the capital would grow. That's what's happened to me and it's, it, it works. Uh, Okay. The main thing is to prevent losses. Kelly W. asked the question, Marty, how do you choose which options to sell in terms of deltas? I thought delta was a fraternity or sorority. <laughs> he, he says that delta is a sorority thing for college. <laughs> but, you know, it, listen, I can tell you what Marty does. He's looking for opportunities. And, and he's explaining to you that he's, you know, kind of moved away from futures and it's more options. So... I just try to determine my risk, Danny. Right. Uh, and, you know, you incorporate, you can't just ask a singular question in that regard simply because of the fact that you have to assess where the VIX is, where you think the mark, whether your market's in a positive or negative mode, a direction, whether you're above or below your indicators, or go back to my book where I talked about red light, green light. Yeah. Um, and, Remember, the red light district's more expensive than the green light. <laughs> it is if you're married. Um, anyway. Listen, uh, YUWA says, for the T-theory, short-term oscillator, do you look at the direction, zero line, or just non-confirmation you mentioned? Well, the, the, the theory behind the T-theory is that it, it le the oscillator leads... Um, um, and the idea is that the oscillator precedes price movement. Joe Granville used to have uh, a thing, I think he used to say volume precedes price. Um, so that uh, you have to, there, there are no hard and fast rules. You have to, it's kind of like going into a coal mine. You've got to go down there and experience it and look for, for patterns. Uh, I'm working with my kids now. And um, I keep explaining to them that you have to um, utilize these indicators over and over and over again until you acquire a familiarity and a confidence level where you can then tee it up. Um, the oscillator presumably would lead price, but it, it's a function of your interpretive skills. Right. Let's see. Michael M., at what point do you adjust your deltas against your negative gamma? Um, I utilize those in oil uh, when I was trading options. Um, see, I'm old school. I'm a street corner guy with a good education. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, my son had worked on an options desk, and he was at the University of Pennsylvania, and he was in arts and sciences because I'm a big believer in a liberal arts education. Everybody always said, well, why didn't you go to Wharton? I said, well, it's better to be well-rounded. You know, you can always learn that later on. So I got him a job in, uh, in the summers working for an option firm in New York. And um, every time he would take a class at Wharton, I'd tell him to go kick their ass and get a straight A, which he did every time. But when he took the option class, he could have taught the course. Um, but being able to teach the course and translate in that into money and profits is a whole different course of life. Um, so I can't exactly, it, it's really a function of your risk tolerance. So it's not a, a question, it's kind of like uh, an algebraic equation you're giving me where you can solve it if you can hold things constant and have one unknown. But in this situation with an algebraic equation, you can't solve it if you have several unknowns. And that's why I can't answer the question for you. Right. Uh, okay, this is a good question. I mean, um, Ted Yu says, Marty, what's your view of the S&P 500 now? Um, they're 500 pieces in it? Yes, yeah, there's 500 stocks in there, I think. <laughs> um, I can only give you a comical story because I can't give you an opinion. Right. Um, um, 
the story is when I had a seat on the Amex in the mid 80s, I had some office space upstairs with a, a large specialist and he had a fellow trading for him uh, and he was sitting in the room upstairs trading and we all had jackets on the floor and in those days you could to be on the floor you had to make an appearance but you didn't have to stay there all day you could leave orders with a broker a two dollar broker and leave um, so uh, in the middle of the morning I went to the floor short uh, position and I went down the floor and put on a couple trades and left some orders with brokers and I came back upstairs and um, when I got back upstairs I was long. Well the guy was very upset uh, with me uh, so he started swinging a aluminum baseball bat in my direction and I said there are two things wrong here Jerry. I said hey you don't subscribe to my service which I don't have. And the second thing is, I'm not responsible for, I'm just trying to feed my family. I'm not responsible for what you do. I went to the floor and I saw something and I went from long to, sh from short to long and that's life. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I guess what he's, look at, again, I think it goes back to options trading. You know, he, he doesn't, he doesn't care if it goes up or down. In fact, he, he just wants it to stay still. Um, you know, as an option trader, you just want when you're selling premium, you just want it to do exactly what it's doing over the last couple of weeks. Let's see. Um, what else. You know, I I can't give you a forecast because I, you know, I can change my mind uh, based on some news uh, um, event that occurs tomorrow or something. So that'd be kind of silly. the The key to being a great trader is is to be flexible and not be um, the problem that. The majority of people that lose have is that um, I when I used to before I became successful I used to say well I will things to happen you know I want things to happen well that doesn't lead to trading success and I'm sure that's the problem of a majority of people in the audience who are trying to to find the holy grail you have to be very honest with yourself and be flexible and that you can't be dogmatic and one of the things is I've stated over and over again is you can't desire the action more than you want to win That's excuse right. me and I didn't become successful until I decided that winning was more important than playing do you pay attention to volume well it's an ingredient I use in the um, calculation of the magic T oscillator which I have uh, on an Excel spreadsheet, but needless to say, I didn't do the spreadsheet. I had somebody smarter than I set up the spreadsheet. I just read the values. <laughs> oh, the, I found a good I found a good question here. Um, this is from Bobby R. Marty, have your tactics changed since the Pitbull book was written? Yeah, I mean, uh, my work ethic has not changed, but I love markets because I view them when like when you're a child and you have a kaleidoscope and you shake it up and look through the the porthole and uh, you get a different picture every time you 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 look at the uh, the viewer um, my tactics have changed in the sense that uh, um, I as my capital increased I went in the direction of selling premium because with the knowledge that most options expire worthless, um, that seemed like a better game than uh, the futures are very difficult now because the the um, I'm astounded. If you think back to um, what I told you about Danny when he was on the floor with a deck of cards, um, the brokers then knew where all where the stops would build up, yep. and they would tell people where the highest incidence of stops lay and that would uh, sort of act as a have a magnetic pull in that direction to the same extent that the stops were determined by human nature they wanted to risk X or they were getting out at the low of the day uh, Danny and I uh, are not very good singers but we composed a song about take out the highs, take out the lows, 
Well, that was based on um, old school crowd running the stops. To the same extent, the algorithmic trading um, methodology seemed to target what the psychological levels where you would play stops, and they're quite good at that. And they try to, one of the things that Danny's pointed out to me with the market delta is what, after they run stops through a level and then he'll flip up a certain number of buys after a decline, he'll notice that the volume has diminished, has abated on the sell side, and then it'll flip to the buy side. And he can see that on his market delta indicator, and uh, that helps him go with red light, green light, the change of direction, et cetera, et cetera. However, it does, it's, nothing's guaranteed in life. It can be mm -hmm. false. You can get hit with another wave of selling. You right. can certainly have a, something occur in the news uh, arena or whatever, but it, then that, you're always looking for lower risk entry points, but you must then utilize the discipline of defining your risk and not pyramiding into a position. Now, I know lots of people that pyramid into a position. Well, that can work. It's like uh, going to the roulette table, the old theory about betting black or red or odd or even. If you have enough capital, eventually you'll get your money back. But the house has figured that out. So they limit the size of the bet, and you're probably limited by the size of your capital. So that doesn't work. And to the same extent, uh, pyramiding your position to prove to yourself that you're right, or going back to the psychological of, I said, willing my position to win is not what leads to fame and fortune. Well, or happiness at home. Yeah, no, it doesn't, <laughs> that's for sure. But you know, like in the old days, Marty, when I picked up the phone for you, and again, I, there, he, he, he was, Marty's probably the most demanding tr trader I've ever worked with in my life. And as I've said, I've worked with a lot of traders, but, in the old days, what Are we you would trying do... to call me a bad name? <laughs> no, I would never do that. But anyways, we did. We we went at it on the phone. You know, it, there would be good days and bad days, if, and it, and I think it all goes back to to making money. If you're making, he he was in a great he was in a great mood. You know, we can play much better golf when I'm making too. <laughs> right, you're much better at golf when you're making. But in the old days, if he was long and he knew I had that UBS program line. And he knew I had more capital on the other side. The, the yeah. S&P would start to downtick a little bit. And he'd pick up the phone. And he'd go, what are you doing? And I'd say, Stop hey, eight even, on, eight even on 100 and sell 500. And he'd go, oh, fuck you, and hang up the phone. <laughs> so that's how that went. But like he's saying today, we get attacked by these algos. And we never even see him coming. And, and like he said, you can get down to a low where you kind of think the program's ebating. And all of a sudden, you can see a couple buys it, and then whoosh, down they go again. So, you know, when it goes to this futures trading, I'm going to be the first to admit it. You know, I, I don't make on every trade. I, I struggle. Um, I do see the levels. I do understand premiums, and I do understand volumes. And like Marty said on the charts, I, I'm very good at reading those charts. If there's people in the room that are my room that know me, they know. They can say it right now. I pick highs and lows all the time. They look terrible, you know. Marty will pick me up. Ah, oh, this stuff's horrible. And I'll say, Marty, they got to do this morning sell program, and then they got to run them back up, and then we'll figure out what they do later. But there's always a two-way trade in there. You know, they got to run those buy stops. They got to run those sell stops. Um, Anthony, let's see, Anthony B, a lot of trades, traders trade aim to trade multiple markets at once. You seem to be a fan of trading one market at a time, would you say that's true? What I found is each market has different nuances. I used to, in the early days, try to trade S&Ps and bonds, and bonds I could fall asleep with compared to the S&Ps in, in the old days uh, before the Fed got involved with manipulating every market in the world. But um, uh, I think each market has a, a different pulse beat, and I'd rather, rather specialize at something than be a, a, a cook in all different uh, venues. Uh, I found oil to be dramatically different than S&Ps. I think each market, you know, uh, bonds you're talking about 
uh, governmental agencies and currencies impacting their price movement. The reason why I like the stock market so much is you have thousands of barometric readings with individual stocks um, or, uh, you know, in the old days, 30 years ago, you'd watch General Motors and IBM, you know, as your barometer, how they were acting. These days, it's Apple and something else. So the point being is that um, uh, it's much more diversified in the stock market. So it, it, you can get many more inputs. If you're trading oil, it's the price of oil. Yeah, they're, they're there. One of the things that drove me crazy there was uh, the West Texas International Brent spread. It would go between flat and $28. So what you'd have all your positions in WTI, and it'd be, be being pulled along by events in Europe, and Brent would be moving WTI. Yeah. So I found that that was one of the reasons why, I, after nine years, I took all my money and said, I'll see you later. Um, uh, bonds, I found them uh, extremely difficult in the sense that they're, they're slow. They're very, at least they used to be, very, very slow. And they're more of a homogeneous entity. So, uh, um, and they also would trade. I had one guy who became a big hedge fund guy I interviewed about 25 years ago. And he said, well, they would always put their positions on before the news announcement came out, a day before, the afternoon before, because they wanted to gamble on how the market would react to their news. And they would bet on, on that. So... Uh, they're all different strokes. I, I um, you know, when I, I ran a couple hedge funds and people would always ask me in the late 80s, uh, well, what do you think in Europe? And da, 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 da. I said, you know, when I master the U.S., I'll go over to Europe. <laughs> um, I, I believe in concentrating and dominating one space and they all pay you the same amount of money if you're, if you're successful. Here's a good question. And and S, Pitbull, do you think you could achieve the same level of success if you had to start in this era of Elgo HFT? I am going to be seventy. I won't tell you the date. You can look it up. <laughs> I don't want too many cards and letters, frankly. Um, I told you when I turned sixty ten years ago. I proclaimed it my Ray Kroc decade. For you youngsters who don't know Ray Kroc, who Ray Kroc was, he had some hamburgers in California and milkshakes from the McDonald brothers in the 1950s, and he bought out McDonald's and um, made a fortune. But he did that when he was in his early 50s, and he made a fortune in his 60s. Um, so I found when I got, I had been successful all along, but I've had my greatest um, success in the last five years. Kids are out of college, never had a mortgage, um, own racehorses. You know, I get to enjoy the fruits of my labor. So I, I think uh, the opportunities are limitless. They're only... Uh, you're only held back by your work ethic and your desire to succeed. I think there, when I started, I was a security analyst in 1970. Uh, that's in the previous century um, when I got out of business school. And uh, I worked for nine years as a security analyst. I had to buy over-the-counter options. And I never won at that. I mean, that, they were, you know, it was 10% for one month, 15% for three months. You know, you couldn't you couldn't win. Um, but in the early '70s, the uh, they came along with the Chicago Board Options Exchange, and they had 16 options, call options, and then they came out with put options, revolutionary things. <laughs> the O'Connors. And um, these were instruments where I could get leverage. So this was in the early '70s, and by 1978. I had been tired of traveling around the country, and I got married, and uh, my oats had to come to one barn. <laughs> um, Thank God for that. Yeah, so uh, I had to concentrate on being successful. And the more and more leveraged vehicles 
came into being. Um, and with the advent of options and puts and calls, and then futures other than the grains and metals evolving, um, they afforded me the opportunity to get leverage. And that's how I made my first millions, was going to the floor of the American Stock Exchange and trading options and increasing my capital many fold. So I would say to you that there's so many more opportunities with different vehicles that your opportunities are far greater than mine were at the time. Yeah, so a, go, fight, win, right. kill. <laughs> there's a lot, right, kill. Because that's what he says all the time. I said, how are you doing today, Marty? He goes, I'm doing okay. I said, well, that's, you know, you tell me the number. I'll go, that's great. He goes, no, that's not. Because I want to kill him. I don't want to win. I want to kill. But, and for uh, all those out there, I'm looking for you, too. I want to beat you. <laughs> Still. But uh, listen, you know, I, what I'm going to do here, I don't, you know, I, we could have Marty stay a little longer, but he does have stuff. You're going to have to today. increase the fees. Yeah, I'm going to have to give him a little more, <laughs> a little more zing to keep around. So let's see. Uh, zero <laughs> times zero is zero. Yeah, zero. Yeah, right. I so zero that's... sum of zero is zero. Yeah. Um, but here, you know, why don't we do this? I'm going to take these questions and I'll try to, to Let me you know, try to break. pull them and maybe email them to Marty and ask him if he can answer some. But there's just too many to answer. But let's, what I want to do is because he has been a big opponent of tr program trading. And I want to talk about this particular slide in front of you. One, the spoofing. You know, we, we talk well, about Well, I mean, it's, it's absurd. Why, why should you be able to put in 20,000 orders? I, I'm... You know, I think you should have a, a, a mill rate tax on putting in multiple orders, <laughs> right. which would blow them out. I'm for, right. I, you know, we're going back to Quantico, Virginia. We want to kill the bastards. Right. Um, what, we charge them a penny of spoof? Well, whatever. The mills. You can do it in mills. Whatever it is, they're knocked out of the game. Um, they shouldn't have the right. I mean, you know, 60 Minutes when they had Michael Lewis's, uh, promote his book or, or introduce his book, they talked about a company that spent $300 million right. laying, uh, laying fa fiber optic cable from Chicago to New York. Now, I ask you, who, who could spend $300 million <laughs> on fiber optic cable unless they're making more than $300 million? Yeah, only it's the coming guys... out of everybody's pocket. Right, only the and they guys they said, are... well, it's only a penny a trade, right. and the, the uh, little guy's doing much better. Well, my son trades with me, and he said, I went to sell some stock the other day, and I went to hit the bid. And I only got X number of shares, and <laughs> then they, they buy the stock, and, uh, they, they sell the stock in front of me, and then buy my stock at a lower price. I mean, it's, it's annoying. Yeah. And it's thievery. It was like the old well, days. Well, there's a, a company that's filed for a public offering, a high frequency trading yeah, we operation. Got that here. Let me move well, that we'll slide. stay off the names. Right and, there. No, there we and, go. We... And they filed. Um, a public offering, which they rescinded last year when the uh, when the heat, the publicity uh, uh, shown on them, and that was they had one losing day in 1,250 days. Well, I'm sorry to report that in their new prospectus, <laughs> they've had one losing day in 1,500 days. So <laughs> they didn't lose a day last year. So um, I'm pretty good at my game, and I'm a baseball lover, and I know if you hit th over 300, you're going to be making eight figures a year playing baseball. I know if you're um, uh, good at it, they're going to pay you a lot of money if you hit over 300. In trading, if you bat over 50, 60 percent, you're pro if you're using discipline, you're going to be making quite a bit of money. But you're sure as hell not hitting 99.99999 percent of uh, winners. So I ask you, where's the SEC? Where's the CFTC? And what rock are they sleeping under? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a, now that's a good question. Um, you know, a couple of guys asked if you'd come back and do this again sometime. Would you consider it? Sure. I, I mean, am I going to have to double your pay or, um, you know, zero, zero uh, plus zero? I'm a big believer in charity. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I want to thank Marty Schwartz and, hey, you guys, and I want to thank you guys, and I don't want you to leave. But, you know, look, if you've never read this book, you really have done some harm to yourself. And my, the only guy I'm really interested in reading is Marty.
You really should get this book. It's Jack Swagger's book. And, you know... The, what about that, my book? And the, and the Pitbull <laughs> and the pit bull book. I got that up. Uh, I had that up on your slide. Um, I'm still getting uh, royalties from China. I got a check a week, <laughs> you get that. A week ago. Yeah, I mean, you keep those cards and China. letters coming. <laughs> well, listen, thanks so much for coming in, Pitbull. Right, my pleasure. You're, a, you're the best. I got to go to the horse races now. <laughs> yeah, he's going to the horse races. <laughs>